Okay, I think we can go ahead and uh, kick things off. Uh, so I just wanted to welcome everyone. Um, I'm Rachel Larson, so I'm a teaching assistant professor and program director in the College of Health Solutions at Arizona State University. Uh, my current work is focused on military readiness and cross-cutting prevention in military and veteran populations. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining our Health Talk webinar um, brought to you by the College of Health Solutions at ASU. Um, our college works to address the challenges facing people uh, and communities to stay healthy, uh, improve their health, and then also manage chronic disease. Um, so these health talks are just one way that we serve the community with uh, some timely and relevant uh, educational information. It also provides you with some continuing education credits at no cost. Um, so before we get started, I just wanted to go through a quick um, couple of housekeeping items. Um, first, just to let everyone know um, that this session is being recorded um, and it will be posted on our website at asuhealthtalks.com. Uh, after each of our panelists present as well, then I will moderate a Q&A session. So we're going to have them present first and then questions at the end. Um, please submit your questions into the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen as opposed to the chat box. Um, and then after our session today, uh, you will be receiving a brief survey that's just going to ask for your input about today's webinar. Um, if you're requesting any continuing education credits uh, for your attendance, uh, you will need to complete the survey first uh, in order to receive credit. Um, if you didn't apply for CEUs, then we'd still appreciate your feedback on better ways to improve uh, our Health Talk series. Um, so today, um, our topic is veterans health and supporting the transition to civilian life. Um, joining us today are Shiloh Catlett. Um, so Shiloh is a clinical social worker. Um, in the post 9-11 military to VA program within the Phoenix VA healthcare system. Uh, during almost nine years at the Phoenix VA, Shiloh has focused her efforts on enhancing and streamlining the process uh, for transitioning service members. Um, she's worked with veterans with serious mental illness designations, um, and she's the residential substance uh, abuse uh, works with that program as well. Um, Shiloh was appointed as the lead program manager for the VISN 22 post 9-11 military to VA case management program um, and actively serves with the Strategic Communications National Committee. Um, Shiloh will be followed by Dee Person. Um, Dee is the assistant director of the Arizona Coalition for Military Families. Um, Dee is also a graduate of the United States Naval Academy and a combat veteran uh, who served during Operation Enduring and Iraqi Freedom. Um, as part of her role with the Arizona Coalition for Military Families, uh, Dee works to support service members, veterans, and their families. Um, Dee and her team are focused on empowering all Arizona residents uh, with the knowledge and skills to make a difference in the lives of those around them through four key areas, um, statewide coordination and collaboration, uh, professional development and community education, regional community capacity building, and also strategic partnerships. So we're very fortunate to have both of these health experts with us today um, as we're going to explore some of the issues that are faced by veterans as they transition into civilian life. Um, we have more than 200,000 uh, men and women who transition out of the military every year. Um, and as we all know, life transitions can be difficult, uh, but for a veteran, they have multiple transitions happening all at once um, and kind of in an instant. Um, so we also know that there's a lot of struggles that come along with, you know, changes in possible, you know, geographic location, uh, household, um, identity shift. Um, they also may be experiencing loss of camaraderie um, and sometimes also loss in sense of purpose. Um, so key to, you know, successful transition is really connecting our service members to both resources and support. Um, so let's go ahead and dive into a discussion uh, on the challenges that veterans face and better ways that we can support them during this often stressful transition. Um, we'll go ahead and start with Shiloh. 
who will be covering physical and mental concerns, um, how local screening is occurring, eligibility for VA healthcare, and also ways to uh, connect veterans to the VA and its extensive services. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Shiloh to share. Thank you so much. I'll make sure I share the right screen. I have three, and so it's a little overwhelming. Okay. Is everyone seeing themselves as well? Looks good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Rachel, for the introduction and sort of the, the quick brief elevator speech on covering everything <laughs> that we'll be talking about. Um, so as Rachel mentioned, my name is Shiloh Catlett. I'm a clinical social worker with the post 9-11 military to VA case management program at the Phoenix VA. So this is just a short timeline um, because not many people have heard of the post 9-11 M to VA, lovingly known as uh, case management program. So we started back in 2003 in, in, the, in response to OEF, OIF, um, and all of the combat deployments in response to 9-11. So the, the VA liaison program was established to assist in that transition, um, specifically related to combat veterans as they were coming back home from deployment to bridge the gap in connection to VA healthcare. In 2005, the Office of Seamless Transition was established, um, just further solidifying the actual processes and putting in some structure to what that transition process and support would look like. In 2007, the OEF, OIF, OND case management program was actually established, um, providing staff in the VA hospitals to um, welcome transitioning combat veterans into the VA healthcare system, provide some ongoing case management. And a lot of that really did focus on um, those veterans coming back with a serious injury or illness. Um, coming back from deployment and providing that initial screening and case management. In 2016, as we had some drawdown from combat deployments, they changed the name to the Transition and Care Management Program and expanded the mission to providing those transitional services to all post 9-11 and transitioning service members and veterans, um, regardless of the combat designation. And then in 2001, there was another name change and expansion of the mission um, to the post 9-11 military VA case management program, which we are now. And so we really are the, the point of contact for transitioning veterans, whether they've deployed or not, um, and connecting to and establishing care within a local VA healthcare system, wherever they are residing. So the post 9-11 military to VA case management program is a national program. It is a nationally directed program. Um, so every VA does have at least one point of contact to serve as the post 9-11 M to VA. Um, here in Phoenix, we do have a pretty large team uh, compared to some of the other states, maybe only have one or two people. So I think that we are pretty luck lucky here in Phoenix to have some leadership support um, to maintain the resources that we do have to continue to provide the transitional services that we do. So one um, task or opportunity that we have with the post 9-11 M to VA program is we receive a report that is updated daily with any post 9-11 veterans that are establishing care, connecting to care at the Phoenix VA healthcare system. And our team has the opportunity to make an initial outreach phone call to them, um, kind of check in with them, welcome them to the Phoenix VA. Um, and one thing that we do ask about is, is chronic illnesses or health conditions within the last 12 months that they've been diagnosed with. And so this is um, from fiscal year 22, the responses that we've seen, just to kind of provide a little glimpse of what we're seeing with number one being chronic pain. And that's pretty consistent. I do talk uh, here in a second just about a couple of different research articles, but chronic pain, muscular skeletal conditions are definitely number one that we are seeing in transitioning veterans as they're coming off of active duty um, with or without. Uh, deployment. So it, it, it isn't always specifically related to a deployment that they're going to have that chronic pain and muscular skeletal concerns. Um, and then we see pretty um, equally depression, anxiety, PTSD. One thing that isn't on here is sleep issues. That's um, also one of the top three, which you'll see here. Um, and so you do see that that bar for other is definitely the longest because it doesn't include sleep issues, it doesn't include, um, we have seen some different types of cancers coming back as well. 
So this is a radio button that we can select, but this is what we're seeing here locally in Phoenix. So this is one of the research articles that I was just talking about um, that was completed in 2016 and the analysis were completed in 2019. So it looked at a sample of uh, 90, over 9,500 veterans that were recruited from a roster of separating service members. Um, so they looked at veteran status, functioning and satisfaction um, regarded to health work and social relationships. And they looked at three months from separation and then six months later. So these were kind of the, the key takeaways from that. Um, so here's that, that chronic physical condition or that chronic pain that I was mentioning. So one and two report a chronic physical condition. Um, nearly a third are reporting mental health conditions, 40% chronic pain, 31% reporting sleep problems. More than one out of five are reporting anxiety and depression. 20% um, are re reporting a problematic financial concern, which I believe Dee talks about. Um, and Rachel briefly mentioned just during that transition, it is a, a drastic kind of overnight change in financial status and structure. Um, having that ongoing constant paycheck and then you're discharged. And if there's no employment set up or if there's no service connection, disability retirement, any of that, um, and that is a drastic shift in the transition. Um, some positives that were found is over half had found work within three months um, and over two thirds were working at the at that second time point at the six month mark. And then about 80% reported um, having a significant other or relationship. Um, so there's a lot of work that's being done at USC, the University of Southern California looking at transitioning veterans, uh, working with the military veteran programs. And um, nationally, we just have recently had a presentation from Sarah Kinsel, um, who's done a lot of research. And they recently um, released some of the results from looking at a holistic approach to understanding the experience of transitioning veterans. Um, so they looked at veterans well-being overall and really addressing as, as a holistic, looking at the entire person in their environment, in their family structure, uh, psychosocial, financially, occupationally, spiritually, um, as well as physical and the positive impact that that's going to have on a veteran's physical changes during the transition. And so they also noted those top three items that I had talked about um, with chronic pain, sleep issues, and then mental health being depression and anxiety. And so one thing that Sarah had noted as she was presenting was that the break in transition, during that transition, the break from active duty, the constant movement, the PT every day, the, the wear and tear on the body, and then transitioning into a civilian status and maybe a job that you're sitting at a desk or maybe you're not working um, and you're at home, but physically stopping and your body finally having that break um, is when a lot of veterans are sort of realizing these unmet health needs that they may have been able to maybe not ignore, <laughs> but maybe find a workaround um, while they've been active duty and now it's, it's coming up. And so it's during that transition period that it is so important to address those healthcare needs. Um, the VA has also looked at a lot of environmental exposures, and this is not specifically just related to transitioning service members, um, but this is for all veterans, um, environmental exposures, and there are registries. So there's the, the link on here if you are interested in more information on the environmental exposures, but um, looking at specific impacts of the exposures during service. So whether it's chemical exposures, exposures to radiation, air pollutants, occupational hazards, and warfare agents. Um, hopefully there's been some information about the PACT Act, and this is uh, directly related to environmental exposures and ensuring that veterans, whether they've recently transitioned or they've been out for several years, have an opportunity to complete an, an exposures exam. Um, I do have a link in my web in the presentation as well for the PACT Act, uh, so everyone can get more information on that if you haven't received it yet. Um, but what we're looking at specifically with our most recently transitioned specific deployments um, are the airborne hazards and burn pit exposures. So these are smoke and fumes from burn pits, sand dust and particulate matters, um, general air pollution, 
exposures to fuel, aircraft exhaust, smoke from oil well fires. Um, and this is just a map of the countries and bodies of waters that are currently included in the registry. And so if you are working with a veteran who did have a deployment to any of these countries or talk about having exposures um, to airborne hazards, burn pits, any, any, any sort of exposure, I would definitely direct them to the, the public health website here. Even if you just Google VA, uh, VA exposures, it'll bring it up. But there are certain um, locations that they, there is a registry opportunity. And so any veteran who was exposed to any of the airborne hazards or burn pits, they can go on and complete that online registry. And so what that does is it um, takes their information, it takes their, their deployment information. It also, because it does put them into the registry, um, when there's more information that comes out as far as uh, possible implications after these exposures, a lot of information from the PACT Act then gets disseminated to those who have been on the registry. So completing the registry does not immediately start healthcare treatment. It does not have anything to do with benefits, um, but it does get the veteran involved and receiving more education and information, and then also provides the VA with some additional information as far as impacts of these exposures. Um, so with the PACT Act, there was also an expansion of presumptive conditions. I'm not gonna go through all of these because there's a lot, um, but this is a list not all inclusive list because there's about 15, 10, 10 additional cancers um, that are included as a presumptive condition for any veteran who was um, exposed to um, the, the burn pits or any other uh, toxic exposures during the most recent deployments. Um, so what this means is if a, a veteran has experienced, we'll say COPD, they've been diagnosed with COPD, um, they did have a deployment and were exposed to burn pits, they, the presumptive conditions. So the VA is now saying that this is assumed related to service. So this also impacts benefits. Um, so service connected disability, a veteran can go and then apply for service connection condition, a service connected disability related to COPD from their exposures. Um, another condition that we are seeing a lot with our veterans is a TBI, a traumatic brain injury. Uh, so between 2000 and 2021, more than 450,000 service members have been diagnosed with a TBI. Um, there's a dramatic increase in the prevalence of TBI due to blast injuries. So because of all of the um, expansion of the equipment and the equipment is much better, <laughs> the safety equipment, the helmets, the gear, that service members are wearing during deployments, we have a lot more service members that are surviving the blast injuries. And so that's where a lot of the TBI is coming from. Um, they are surviving and they're experiencing traumatic brain injuries or mild traumatic brain injuries, which is this MTBI. Um, and so across all severities of TBI, their symptoms and impairments tend to be more severely immediately following the injury. So those things should be addressed during the deployment. Um, it's likely that community providers will be seeing these veterans several months, even years after TBI. Um, very rarely are we seeing new symptoms that are presenting months, years after the initial injury. Um, so if a veteran is complaining of a new, a new onslaught symptom and they're saying it is related to TBI, I would look at what else may be causing that. Um, so just generally, these are some symptoms that we see related to TBI going across the gamut of, of physical, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral impacts of a traumatic brain injury. Um, and a lot of this, if uh, there's a lot of overlap between symptoms of TBI and then also symptoms of PTSD. And so sort of weeding out um, whether it's the, the physical impact of a TBI or the mental health impact of PTSD or I mean, just depression, anxiety, um, but looking a lot of, and the VA does a lot looking at uh, cognitive impacts and then also physical. So at the Phoenix VA specifically related to TBI, um, we have the polytrauma team that is an interdisciplinary team with nurses, um, physiatrists, we have neurology, we have occupational therapy, we have physical therapy, um, speech and language pathologists that do the memory and cognition. 
you know, memory rehab. Um, so they're, they're all looking at TBI and symptoms of TBI and how to address it holistically and um, as an interdisciplinary team versus just sending to neurology to address maybe just the physical impacts of the TBI. Um, and then here's just some resources and more information. I don't know if I can get you all the, the PowerPoint presentation to provide to everybody, um, but these are just links for more information. Um, if you are interested in more education on TBI, this Rocky Mountain Myrick TBI toolkit is was recently released, has a lot of really great information, um, general information on TBI, information and education on screening and assessment, different intervention tools, resources that are available to address TBI. These are the, the link that I was talking about for the environmental exposures. Um, the VA welcome kit, uh, if you have a veteran that maybe hasn't connected to VA, I would just send them to VA.gov. Um, it's been updated, so it's a lot more user friendly, but a veteran can see their eligibility. They can apply for healthcare eligibility on there. They can apply for their service connected benefits. Every, every benefit and entitlement that is offered through the VA is now on VA.gov through one website. Uh, so I guess that would be my, my big key takeaway is if you are working with a veteran that has not connected to the VA, have them apply for health care benefits um, because there's a lot of veterans that don't know that they're eligible for VA health care um, and they can apply online and it'll tell them within a couple of minutes whether they're, they're eligible or not. And so in a couple of those research articles that I was talking about, they were looking at one of the key things that impacts a veteran's success in their transition um, and why they aren't receiving care, they, they aren't accessing the care that they need, they're not aware of the benefits um, that they're entitled to is the lack of education piece that they just don't know where to go to. Um, they don't know who to go to. They don't know that they're eligible for VA healthcare. And so my, my ask to everybody is if you are working with a veteran or if you are a veteran, if you have family members that are veterans is ask them if they've been connected to the VA, have them look at their eligibility and enrollment um, and really encourage them to, to tap into the VA because the, the VA really are the subject matter experts in providing care and treatment to service members and veterans. Um, and then if you forget all of that, just have them call me. <laughs> I'm happy to help them walk through eligibility. I'm happy to meet with them and walk them over to eligibility. I can walk them through the website, whatever it is that they're needing. So there's, there's my contact information. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Shiloh, for sharing with us and sharing some resources uh, and information. Um, again, we can hold some questions for Shiloh um, till the end. Um, next, we're going to hear from Dee, uh, who will be providing us with an overview of military culture um, and some unique experiences of our military members. Um, she's also going to share with us kind of the mission of the Arizona Coalition for Military Families um, and some of the upstream prevention efforts that are ongoing. So Dee, I'll let you go ahead and take it away. All right. Well, it's good afternoon. So uh, thank you. And there's a lot of things you might hear me repeat, uh, but in a good way or piggyback off of what Shiloh just shared. Um, and it goes hand in hand. We are strategic partners with the uh, VA healthcare system. Um, let me make sure my slides are advancing. All right, can you see that? We're going to the, oh, right. I see some heads bobbing, wonderful. Yep. Um, so just to understand, you may have heard us identified as the Arizona for um, Arizona Coalition for Military Families. You may have heard us uh, identified as Be Connected. And this is just a little quick clarity on, on who we are, how we work. Um, so the coalition has been in existence since 2009. Um, we started off very small. Our director, um, Director Thomas Winkle, is a licensed professional counselor. And he was actually brought into a work in the community of the National Guard. Uh, he and a colleague were going out and just actually interviewing the family members and the service members, our National Guardsmen and women who were coming back from deployments and just asking how they were doing. And it really was more of a Q&A. And the ultimate um, response from everyone, the overwhelming response was, we need help 
gathering resources and understanding what we qualify for. Um, and so that's really how the coalition came into fruition. It was grassroots efforts and, um, and now it's a statewide initiative. So fast forward to 2017, um, you'll see here who our strategic partners are, um, but the Clay Hunt Act was passed in 2015 and 16. And that was a, a mandate for suicide prevention within the VA healthcare system. And we were already doing this work you know, since 2009. We then named it the initiative Be Connected uh, with this collective impact model, bringing the right people into the room to get to the root cause. Um, and we know here in Arizona, we have over 500,000 service members, veterans, uh, family members, and caregivers. And think about that ripple effect in the state of Arizona. So first, I want to thank you for coming to this webinar to learn more, because without a doubt, you know someone who has served or a family member. Uh, and we're going to talk about how that impacts them. Um, and how you can provide resources and support. All right, so those strategic partners. To your left, you're going to see again, the VA healthcare system is listed there nice and big in the center. Uh, we work very closely with the governor's office, uh, the uh, faith, youth, faith and family um, department. We also work with the National Guard, all of our installations here uh, in the state of Arizona. On a state level, we work hand in hand with the Arizona Department of Veterans Services. And then a very unique concept that you wouldn't think always plays, you know, in each state we work differently, uh, but we work closely with the Access Healthcare System. And that's very unique um, to be able to work with their directors, their healthcare plans to make sure that we come from a holistic approach, really, uh, those wraparound services. So if someone doesn't qualify for the VA or has their own personal reasons why they're not using the VA, we also look then to uh, partner with Access to make sure people are getting that care they need. And then last but not least, uh, TriWest. TriWest is the healthcare system that our retirees and our dependents receive care from. So that makes be connected on the strategic partners. But we have over 200 partners that are nonprofits, faith-based communities, the AVSEs, which are Arizona Veteran Supportive Campuses. Um, we have the Arizona Veteran Supportive Employers. So again, coming at it from this holistic approach that it takes all of us to help this population. And that is our strategic plan. So our next slide really goes into how we make this work. So taking your attention to the center circle, our, our theme really is no wrong door, no wrong person, no wrong time. Really removing the barriers that can be put um, either in the client's mind, right? That they feel that they have a barrier in front of them or truly in the systems that we have. These are very big systems that people have to navigate. And so our goal, when you see the outer circles is that it takes that holistic approach, right? We need it from a state, federal, uh, local level. We also need that cross-sector collaboration. We were saying our, our uh, businesses in the community, our employers, we need to make sure we have community helpers who just understand and are educated about what we do. We have some self-serve options on our website so that people who want to go and find out more, they can do that. Um, we go out and educate the community. So we do a lot of training like today, just so that you know what Be Connected is. Um, we have a support line and we're gonna talk about that, how we use our support line to help people as well. Um, and then the last circle that you see there is really those guidelines to care, making sure that we're coming from a place of integrity, uh, because one thing we do know about our military veteran population is that they need to have your trust. They need to trust you. You have to earn that trust. Um, and so do what you say, say what you do, and making sure that the people we coordinate with and collaborate with are coming from that place of integrity as well. Really key for our partnerships. So we're going to kind of dive into some military veteran culture so you understand, for those who maybe don't have that background, just kind of explaining how when we join the military, you come in, right, you're a civilian, um, May you may yourself be a civilian, maybe do not have any military connections or family members, and that person comes in with their views, their opinions, right, that expression of themselves, and we all go into a process called either boot camp. Um, you know, each branch calls it something different, but we literally are stripped down of those individual, you know, representations of ourselves, and we're brought together in uniformity for the mission at hand, whatever we're doing, right, with our organization, our branch of service. Um, and so everything from how we dress in our uniform you know, what um, we can do in our free time, uh, because sometimes we have guidelines where we can go, where we can't go. Um, it's a very unique situation in the military. And those unique bonds 
we take that shift to the right when in the picture that you see of our older veterans, those are unique bonds that last forever. And that's why this uh, population, when we bring them together, they feel that connection because it's very unique very unique to our, you know, family members who have served along with their service members, uh, very unique, again, to the caregivers who have experienced, the, you know, the struggles that a veteran can experience when they transition out. Um, and you have to think about this. Most of our service members come in with between just the ages of 17 and 24. And from a brain development stage, they're not even mature enough, right, to make some of the decisions they're making um, and some of the things that they're experiencing, right, the trauma, the traumatic situations that they can put into or the very big, uh, again, risks that they're taking, uh, the amount of money, the equipment that they're responsible for. I have a 17-year-old and I often think, would I want my 17-year-old, you know, doing the maintenance on the aircraft I was about to get into? Uh, and that's humbling, right, to know that. Um, and again, just put that into perspective, the responsibility, right, that, that you have at such a young age. So I just want to take a moment with this picture because you can look at it and say, wow, this is beautiful, right? It's all these different situations, the diversity. Um, but I want you to even take a deeper look because these are just snippets of these unique characteristics of our military the coming and going, right? We have our going away when we have to deploy. Um, the welcome home, right? When maybe you're seeing a, a child for the first time that was born while you were away, right? Um, the unique relationships where you see those gentlemen lined up in their uh, fatigues or camis, depending which branch you served in. Really, they become your family, right? They have your back literally and figuratively. You're spending so much time together away from your immediate family. Um, the one picture I always like to point out here is our service member holding a weapon, standing a watch. Just to know at this moment, right here and now, there is somewhere, someone somewhere across this country, across the world, always standing the watch. Um, and those, again, between 17 and 24 years old, making the decisions to notify their, you know, um, their superiors, their chain of command, if there's concern or worries, right? They're protecting the people in those bases and units and assets that are there. Um, and so that we can sleep, you know, we're here safely in our environment, not worrying. And there are ladies and gentlemen doing this 24 seven, 365 days a year. Um, and when you raise your right hand, you know, to perfect, to protect and defend the constitution of the United States, it is that time. 24-7, 365 days a year. It's not a part-time job. It's not like you and I, when we come to our job, you know, I clock in, I'm working and I clock out. My, um, my personal business is not, my employers don't need to know about that, but in the military, there's a different mindset, right? It's the unit, you're representing your country, that uniform represents something bigger than yourself. Um, so again, just looking at this and seeing again, the helicopters, the amount of taxpayer dollars, right, that our young service members are responsible for, the lives that they're responsible for. Um, very, very unique. Here's just a quick visual about that active duty you heard me say. Someone who is serving in uniform every day, right? We have a, a star on each day of the calendar. And the reason I'm pointing that out is because truly their lives are not theirs. Um, they don't get to decide where they want to go, when they want to go. Um, they can put in suggestions and they may receive orders, right, to a, a, a job that they were hoping for. But in the end, it's the mission that's the most important, right? And so you may have met veterans that were disgruntled because the, you know, the time that they served, they didn't get to do what they wanted or weren't, you know, able to um, deploy if that's what they were hoping to do. You also may have interacted with some of our National Guardsmen and our service, um, our reservists that also raise their right hand, but their commitment is one weekend a month, two weeks out of the year. And if you've served in any capacity for the reserves or National Guard, or you know someone that has your chuckling, because when you get activated, you look exactly like our active duty service members. And that's important for you to understand because again, the families, right? Every service member is, is connected to a loved one in some capacity um, and that affects their family well, as well, just not that service member. Um, and are they equipped for that? You know, when we were having our multiple deployments in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom, Enduring Freedom, Operation New Dawn, our National Guard um, men and women were activated and our, our reservists at a rate they had never been activated before, multiple deployments back to back. And that had an impact, right, on all levels. So we talk about that, these unique aspects of the military. You know, what are they? 
We talked about camaraderie. So important to understand that they're spending hours, weeks, months together. We eat together, you know, uh, we sleep together in the in the barracks, right? We are, you know, cohabitating in these areas. And then we have to work together. Think about that with your coworkers. Would you want to do that? <laughs> you know, you, no break. Um, I always think about our, our friends that are the submariners. I don't, you know, it takes a special person to be in a small place like that for so long underwater. Um, I was, you know, on two ships for nine months each time for our deployments. And I will tell you, you didn't always get to pull into port for three to five months. Uh, it was a unique situation. And you're getting away from someone, maybe, you know, going outside, uh, standing on the bow of the ship, you know, and try and just take a few deep breaths by yourself before someone comes and stands next to you. Um, it's very unique when you're in an environment like that. But you also have the beautiful aspects of getting to know each other in a way that you wouldn't necessarily your coworkers. The uniform, right? They wear a uniform every day. And the reason we're going to talk about that is the transition out afterwards. When people take off that uniform, I think they often forget the connection to that uniform, right? The, um, the psychological effect of it, it really becomes part of their ego, right? When they are wearing that, it's a walking resume. We know what branch of service they're in. We know usually what awards they've received. We know what rank they are. So how they've promoted, we can guess how much they're getting paid because it's a pay chart, right? Um, we don't walk into the space saying, you know, professor of the year, I've just been published or top salesperson, you know, like the uniform unbeknownst to them is really, again, a resume. And so when they take that uniform off, it's ironic that if they were wearing camouflage uniforms, that their civilian clothes become camouflage. So now they go and transition into that civilian sector and they don't have that connection necessarily that they felt, right? that esprit de corps, the different things, that camaraderie in their unit. They don't have people on the weekends asking them to get together. Families don't spend holidays together necessarily. And there is that issue where it can be a struggle. There can be a definite struggle with that. So I just want to share this video. If it doesn't come through with the audio, I'm going to look to you, Carl, for a thumbs up if it comes through. If it doesn't, I'm going to put a link in to share it with you. I'm not getting the audio. Okay. okay, no problem. I'm going to get back over here to pause it. Okay, well, I will share a video. It's a great video um, that just talks about the mindset when you come home, right? That coming back and how we can at times um, feel like we're going to go right back to the way things were. And that's an absolutely, you know, false statement. We, we are, are all changed when we go and do different uh, situations and environments that, um, again, physically, mind, body, spirit are affected. And so that does a great job of telling that story of how, you know, any generation, uh, any era of our veterans that from our World War II veterans to our more recent conflicts have that struggle, you know, coming home and maybe just picking up where they left off. It's not as easy as you think to be able to do that. Um, but what we always like to share is that 95% of our veterans transition successfully with the help of those family members, those um, community resources. We have that 5% that can struggle, right? They can struggle. Um, and it's usually something that they've come into the military with before, right? They may have had um, their resiliency may not have been strong as strong. They may have had trauma in their lives before that. Uh, they innately may be more anxious uh, or, you know, have depression in their in their background. And so, but 95% of our veterans, we don't want people to think everyone's walking around having trauma and isn't able to function. 95% of our veterans um, and their family members successfully transition into that civilian service. Can they have things that trigger them? Can they have obstacles that get in front of them and they take a detour and they have to get back on track? Absolutely. But but who does not? So um, we talk about this slide just very quickly again is how when we interact with our community members, our partners, always keeping that mindset uh, to treat everyone with respect and integrity. And a lot of our service members don't self-identify. So now they've become a veteran and they may not say I served. Uh, they might not say I'm a veteran. And that's important for you to know. It, it might be something as simple as just saying, has anyone in you, you know, in your family served? And that may just start a discussion, really listening and being open-minded. 
some don't feel that they have served if they were in the National Guard, if they were in the reserves, if they didn't deploy. So again, just being open to hearing their conversation. Uh, we as an organization, we see everyone who's raised that right hand as having served and as, as their family members as well. Just want you to know that we, we respect and honor that and we will help them in any way we can. So how do we do that? Um, we have this ecosystem of support and I just wanna go through this really quickly because it's the social determinants of health. And this is what Shiloh was talking about. You know, a lot of our service members do struggle with these when they're transitioning out, right? It's again, with the right resources, they can get back on path. But as she had mentioned, a steady paycheck, having birthing, right? A housing always paid for and taken care of. It might be similar to some of the college students you've interacted with, right? All of a sudden the services aren't there and they have to learn this or relearn these things. Um, and so there can be a struggle. They don't maybe have like financial savviness. Um, they don't know that they have some benefits that they, they could apply for. Um, and so our team, when you call our support line, you have the ability to do a screening. Uh, we do the social determinants of health, very nonchalant. We'll ask them what they're looking for today. How can we help them? And then we'll just ask some follow-on questions through these, what we call, you know, 10 areas of focus or social determinants. And oftentimes, if someone's calling in for one thing or on behalf of someone, there's usually three or four more things they need support with, right? There is usually some overlap. Um, so we help with everything from, you know, people getting food boxes and taking that stigma away, getting it delivered to their house for free because they might be struggling financially. Or maybe they had substance abuse issues, which is very common when people transition out, right? They go and start using either drugs and alcohol because they're not getting tested anymore, right? As they were in the military. Arizona is a legal state now, right? And so they may get themselves into situations where they didn't know they had, you know, the tendencies for addictions. And so how do we help them? How do we get them the right resources at the right time, removing those barriers? This video is not going to play, but again, I will put them in afterwards. Um, our upstream approach really is about intervening early with those social determinants of health. Our goal is that people are aware of these resources so they don't get to a point of crisis, right? Um, we come from a place of if we can offer assistance or help, they're not going to feel alone, right? We help them navigate these resources that can be overwhelming. It's a different language. They've gotten very used to their military acronyms and language and routines. And so coming out to the civilian sector where there isn't a, a standard operating procedure for those who've been in the military, you know, a textbook of instructions and everything to do, that can still be overwhelming to someone, the lack of structure. So again, early intervention, we know we have that better chance of, you know, um, interceding. So here's our ecosystem. It's a very busy slide. Again, I'll send a video. The video basically talks about each unique person, right? It's going to be uh, a veteran, maybe a young veteran that comes out and they may be in their mid twenties if they came in at 17 or 18, they may have served for four years. We have our senior veterans. They are gonna look at different perspective from mental health. They might be wanting to talk to a spiritual leader because there might be stigma with mental health providers. So we know how to talk and get them to the services that they may need. Um, they may have had a bad experience in the VA. So we ask them to reconsider and we share some of the things that they've improved on. Uh, every organization improves over time. And we try to have these conversations to show support. We do do a two hour training that dives really deep into what I was going over today. I just wanted to share this. I'll put the registration link in the chat box. So if you'd like more, we do give um, two hour uh, contact hours. It's not CEUs. Some organizations, you know, will accept them, but they are contact hours. And the last thing I just wanted to put in, um, you know, here's our community uh, email address. That's a general inbox that I monitor with my team. Here's the support line that I mentioned. Monday through Friday, um, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. You can talk to one of our 12 service members, uh, or excuse me, veterans, military connected employees. All of them have served or their family members have served. So they understand this lifestyle. They understand the struggles um, and they will help you, you know, guide anyone that you're interacting with. And that's important for you to know. You're going to go to a, you know, to, to an event and you're going to say, I went somewhere. It was this organization. I can't remember. Remember the phone number, 1-866-4AZ-VETS. Again, we can help you. We'll, we'll help translate that phone call. If you're like, someone told me to call. I don't know why. Um, we'll talk them through and see what can, we can help them with.
there's our one of our websites. Um, if people are interested interest in partnerships, sometimes you know of an organization that is doing great work and we want to invite them into our ecosystem of support that they have resources. And that's the it. That's the end. So I know we just have some time for questions and I'll turn it over you to you, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dee. Uh, a lot of great information that you shared there. Um, and it looks like we do have some good questions coming in here. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with the first one from Kate Dobler. Um, what are the resources for VA veterans and or their families who are diagnosed with substance abuse or use disorder? All right, I will jump on that one. I was sort of reading through them for <laughs> making sure I had phone numbers and correct answers for this. Um, so the Phoenix VA um, actually has an entire substance use disorder clinic. So we offer inpatient and residential, so intensive outpatient and residential substance abuse treatment um, within the VA. So I can put in the self-scheduling phone number, veterans, if they're connected to primary care or mental health, their provider can submit a consult, um, but they can call directly. Um, our emergency department also has mental health staff 24 seven. So if they're in crisis and needing some assistance now, now they can walk into the emergency department and get connected to some substance abuse treatment as well. Um, but it is outpatient and residential. And there's a whole gamut of services offered, whether it's individual substance use treatment um, or our intensive outpatient is nine hours a week. So three days, three days a week, three hours each day. But I will put the phone number in the chat as well. Great, thank you. Um, it looks like Dee just posted some of the, the videos as well in the chat, so thank you. Um, next, we have a question from uh, Michael Moody. Uh, so during the veteran separation appointment, there may be symptoms or effects from service that have not yet surfaced. If the veteran has not disclosed things that they have not experienced, um, as you mentioned, going from being active duty or daily to a sedentary environment, uh, nine times out of 10, their compensation and pension department denies these claims. Um, so is there any ongoing conversation to uh, retroactively have these claims um, adjudicated uh, in favor of the veteran? I'll jump on that one too. <laughs> um, so it's not an automatic process, um, but at, at any point in time, any veteran can file a new claim or file um, secondary there's a specific term and I was trying to find it and I had it a second ago, um, but they can always file additional claims or apply for an increase of service connection um, just to have a currently service connected condition reevaluated for an increase. All right, and our next question is from GL Harry Four. Um, as a veteran, I know that navigating the government VA system can be um, onerous, unpleasant, and frankly, downright frustrating. Uh, that said, are these resources offered as part of uh, outprocessing, outprocessing for active military personnel, uh, be they active duty, reserve, or National Guard? Um, often veterans do not know that their health what their health benefits are, not because they don't want to know, but frankly, because they have not been armed with this information. Um, in essence, these resources must become part and parcel of outprocessing when active military personnel separate uh, from active service. I couldn't agree more um, <laughs> that the resources definitely uh, need to be provided to active duty service members, uh, reserves and National Guard sooner. So the VA has is now part of, or has been, but has taken an, an enhanced and increased role in the TAPS program. Um, so I know here locally at Luke Air Force Base, our team is out there every other week, providing information on healthcare benefits, on how to connect to the team, providing information on service connected benefits. I know that the TAPS program itself has a minimum of a six hour brief <laughs> just related to benefits. So service connection, education, home loan, life insurance, all of that. It's a six hour brief. So I think uh, a lot of the transitioning service members sort of glaze over. 
um, but they're also provided resources and contact information. And so our team nationally is working with DOD as well to figure out better ways to provide this information more proactively and earlier. But we are doing our best and also things like this. That's how we're getting the information out is because if someone who's attending this has an active duty service member, family member um, that may not know or may be planning for their transition, they can say, hey, this person was talking all about it. But the, the post 9-11 M2VA team was established to help during that transition period to help navigate all the bureaucracy and the red tape and the difficult part so that it, this, the service members and veterans don't feel like they're going at it alone. Could just add on to that. I um, there are programs being developed. Great point. Um, when I transitioned out uh, of active duty in 2006, and then I was in the reserves. You know, things have improved. We can always do better. One thing that is a, a pilot program right now is called the expiration term of service. And so, at one year out from uh, separating from, you know the military, they are uh, inviting service members to get a um, sponsor. And think about it, for those who have served, we always had sponsor families when we were given new duty locations. So you could know the area, if you had a family, what were the better schools? They're doing that now when people are transitioning out. And so us making sure that they're aware of the resources in the area they're going to be settling in, uh, what kind of military uh, veteran services, you know, installations, what's available to them as veterans. So uh, things can constantly be improved. I know they are making these efforts, you know, um, and it's state by state, we're, we're getting better. All right, thank you. Um, next question from Marissa Blecky. Hopefully I didn't butcher your last name. I apologize if I did. Um, for younger veterans struggling with getting back into the job field or getting additional training, if they may have already used their GI Bill, what other resources do they have? I can share some resources. Uh, Shiloh, is that something you also want to piggyback on then? Um, I will throw a link for Voc Rehab, but the rest is all okay. you. Yeah. So yes, if you've maximized your Voc Rehab, your GI Bill, or I was the person who didn't know I qualified for the GI Bill um, and that it had a term with it. Uh, when when I separated, I, I knew I had a G, GI Bill. I didn't know that after 15 years or whatever, it expired. So I found out about it that um, I didn't qualify, right? And so these things happen. And it's very frustrating when our service members who have served and now become veterans hear this. So we always try to come with solutions. And there are programs out there where they can get free training certificates. Um, one is through the University of Syracuse, where they can get HR certifications, uh, project management certifications. And these are, you know, sometimes between $800 to $1,500. Um, and they get the training and then the payment for that testing. Um, so again, there's there's a lot of opportunities. There's now the Google um, certif certification that is good until December 2023 that is open to anyone, not just veterans. Uh, and those are free certifications that are being offered and again, step-by-step -step guides uh, to improve your, you know, credentials. Um, and then a follow-up question uh, by Marissa, are any resources for veterans struggling with family law issues like child custody or divorce uh, that can um, cause even more stress on them? Uh, what about behavioral health resources? Um, usually there's group therapy at the VA, but um, is private therapy covered for veterans? So kind of a two-part question here. So we have resources um, that are for family members. Uh, one of those is called Headstrong. Uh, the website is Get Headstrong. Um, and those are free mental health services, uh, unlimited. And that's usually for, again, spouses and children um, and the veteran uh, or service member. Um, and there are also a lot of nonprofits that will provide services for free. Um, and there's, so there's lots of ways to help. Now you're asking about the legal side of things. So I, that was behavioral health. From the legal perspective, that's always a touchy one, right? Um, so there are people who are willing to assist pro bono to an extent, and we do have resources that you can call our support line and they'll put you in that right direction. Um, I will say that legal, again, is not 100% free. It might be those initial screenings, and then they'll recommend you someone that will work with you on a, a sliding scale. Um, but that is one of the resources that we struggle, you know, when there are our needs. And just to piggyback on the mental health resources available, um, the VA does offer 
several options for group therapy, but also offers individual therapy and couples therapy as well. Um, I put the phone number in there for any veteran who is interested in connecting to mental health services, they can call and schedule an appointment directly. Um, and then in addition to therapy, there's also medication assessment and management as well. And if it's, um, if the VA isn't able to provide that service in a timely manner, we do utilize community care consults. So tapping into our community care partners to provide that care that the VA pays for through the approved, approved process. All right. Um, next question, Neil Robbins. It seems like a lot of the care is driven by vets and family members being aware of resources and then going out to engage with them. How much more can be done by support services to proactively reach out to vets? And what are the limitations? I think uh, what Dee mentioned earlier is that uh, there's always, there's, always, there's always more <laughs> that can be done. And so a lot of it is, is providing our education to our community partners because we're, we have limitations within how we can work, but we can provide you the education. So when someone comes to you and says, I'm having a real difficult time in navigating this or real frustration um, in figuring this out, you can say, I attended this training and here's a phone number that you can call. Um, and within m to va we do make those proactive phone calls and we're getting about 300, I would say post 9-11 veterans that are registering at the Phoenix VA and attending appointments for the first time. And then on the VBA side, Veterans Benefits Administration side, there is a, a program called Solid Start. So they receive a roster of transitioning service members and make three different attempts throughout the first year of transition to make those phone calls and ensure that the that the veterans have the understanding of the benefits and how to access them. And if they do have questions about healthcare, they are referring directly over to our team. Um, so they would cover the benefit side and then refer to us to follow up on the healthcare side. Okay, and maybe one more quick one. Um, I know somebody's looking for a phone number um, to the M2VA department. And then last question by uh, Charles Hale. Um, what can we do better at for providing on-campus resources for student veterans? No, great question. I can take that. I, I know um, we work closely with the vet centers uh, at all of our community colleges, our universities, all of our educational institutions that will Will let us do trainings or provide information. You know, we know that you have some great services are already in place. Our goal is to come and supplement that, right? To be that again, holistic wraparound. So, um, if there is something that your vet center isn't able to do, vet it's student center, then again, we're hoping that they're referring that you know to the Be Connected support line and saying, hey, what is available? You know, what other things are there out there? We also know of national programs that are available that you know. There are immersive programs where people go in and get, um, uh, again, on-site treatments for them and their families. Uh, one is called Home Base Inc. I can put that in there too. It's fa fascinating uh, the work they do. Um, but I mean, they they fly the families and the service member, the veteran, uh, and they'll spend two to three weeks. And so it's a, again an immersive program for the family and the and the, the veteran. Um, so if there's any questions on that, reach out. Again, the support line is a great way to start, and then we can always follow up with more training if needed. All right. Uh, well, I just want to say thank you, everyone, and thank you to our, our panelists, um, and thank you for all the great questions. Uh, that's unfortunately that's all we have time for today. Um, but we do encourage you to follow the College of Health Solutions on social media, uh, and we have a, a couple uh, links up on the slide, uh, so you can learn more about other opportunities uh, similar to this one. Um, our health talk series will continue next month uh, with a talk on vitamin supplements and precision health insights and uses. Um, that talk will take place on Thursday, December eighth at noon uh, Arizona time. And then details and registration will be available at asuhealthtalks.com. Uh, so thank you again for joining us and have a great rest of your day.